born and raised in Memphis. Um, I lived farther out east for the most part. Uh, when I got old enough, I moved midtown, downtown. Um, you know, my dad's a shoe repairman, plays music on Bill Street. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just lived here forever. Yeah, this is my home. I like it. Everybody's trying to leave, and I'm always trying to stay. We are in Confederate Park, downtown Memphis. Like, there's a statue of Thomas Jefferson. There used to be a, a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, which was one of the Confederate war generals. But he's more famous for the guy that started the Ku Klux Klan. It's just one of the throwbacks to, we actually have, and I guess there's a lot in the South, but it's a park dedicated to the Confederate soldiers. And back in the late 80s, they would protest it, and then we had a huge racist skinhead scene, and they would come out and protest the protesters. It was always really ugly. See, um, right here, up top, right on this, this is all different. This is where Lucero played their very first show. At the corner of that yellow brick building, in the top left, the top right, far right window. Just a punk, that used to be a punk rock house for about a year. And um, then we played eight songs in April of 98. Very first show. We had it on videotape. And I moved and the videotape got crushed. And everybody yells at me now because I threw the whole thing away and supposedly you can just replace the shell. So I threw away some kind of important document of, of us. But, uh, but it is kind of neat because when we played, the, the lights from the Lorraine, the sign were actually in the back window. You know, and you're just kind of... You see it right through the building? When you were standing and watching us play, you could see through the back main window. It was the Lorraine. So it was Dallas killed JFK, we killed MLK kind of situations. Nothing like being from Memphis. There's never been more than two or three black kids in the scene ever, you know, and here. I didn't just, I mean, you grow up, you end up punk rock, you end up dealing with more with the redneck types that, you know, I seem to be more redneck now, but less racist about it or whatever. But it is, it's, you grew up, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's mostly it's your family a lot of times that you would have to deal with, you know, like they weren't necessarily overt racist, but it's just that southern thing, you know, it's it's kind of hard to explain it. You go down and listen to music that's really loud and unintelligible, take off your shirt, and bounce around, you know, and you wear, you know, anti-racist slogan shirts and stuff. And Eventually you rebel, I mean, against, you're rebelling against your parents, you're rebelling against kids at school you don't like or you're rebelling against you know you just and then after a while you end up rebelling against what you were using to rebel against and I don't know if it's a become full circle type situation or you know I mean there's people that are born in Canada they embrace southernness you know what I mean I guess if you toured in a band or came through, you played in the Antenna Club, which was the only place to play for 25 years, but you would, like, every punk rock kid in town pretty much worked at River City Donuts, it's doing it in some various form or for some time. You pretty much did your time at the donut shop, and that's where everybody would hang out. There would be anywhere from two to 50 kids hanging out, drinking and running around, and hanging out in the donut shop. Uh, some people would always just come over here and crash or whatever, I guess. There's a lot of people that didn't have apartments or didn't have places to live that would do it. You know, maybe not for years at a time or anything. It's just, it's pretty gross. It was a gross time in my life. <laughs> I've worked at a rec Last Chance Records for, God, five or six years. And I quit the band for a year. And when we quit the band, or when I quit the band, the store got evicted and we moved down the street from my house and I painted the sign, I gutted out the interior, painted the interior and I organized it and it was like my project for a year. 2074 Walker, 1130th to 630th. Right. Hey Brian. Hey. 
The songs that we play now, and the, I don't know, the kind of sound that we're going for, um, it definitely kind of, it brings back uh, just the good memories of growing up and the good parts of, uh, of being from the South. You grow up slowly and, and kind of over time uh, realize that some of the judgments you made in the past were a little hasty, maybe. and. Um, and and that goes for both, uh, yeah, growing up in the South and then kind of rebelling against that and then getting involved in a very local, very independent scene that's tied into a lot of other local independent punk rock scenes. And, um, and so, yeah, it's kind of natural to go back uh, where you came from. Uh, yeah, you start to rebel against the punk rock itself. You start to rebel against the rebellion and just kind of go back to where you, where you came from. And yeah, you take bits and pieces of what you need from each experience. I believe this is about all I got left in me. Thank you again for sticking around the end of the show. And thanks again to Chris Mills. And I'm back. Service fucking wanderers. For me, my granddad's always been a very uh, intriguing subject. Uh, he died when I was about 12, and then I got to be 18, 19, and going to school as a history major. Got a bachelor's degree in history. And um, so yeah, you start putting it together that, okay, wait, he was exactly my age. You know, when he was my age, he was doing this. He was in Europe and, uh, during World War II. And, so yeah, that'll make you think, because you realize exactly how immature you are, and just how stupid you are, and uh, and how lucky you've been in the past, and um, and how lucky you are in that moment, and then you think of him at the same time in his life, and what he was doing, and uh, yeah, that'll make you think for quite a while. I figure he might understand. Uh, I have a feeling he'd understand the allure of drinking in a different bar every night in a different town. Thank you. I told you I was joining the army. 
sword and a gallon of ice cream, chocolate ice cream, on his belly. Yeah. Laying on two, Laying on two 400 pound men's laps. And a bottle, eating. I think there was a bottle of Jack Daniels. In Maybe. Bottle. And he was, he was eating the ice cream with the plastic sword. Okay, look, I, pr I told him about the naked boots. Yeah, what happened to that, wait. No, they were also This isn't the story. You know, yes. It's all the same party. This is terrible. He said he was in a pool with naked women. No, that was before. <laughs> that was so much fun. Right. He, didn't, he didn't even want to go it's get any more liquor. It's all perspective, my friend. No, it's that all was, perspective. He started <laughs> off with naked women in a pool. Two naked chicks turned into two 400-pound men with you with a plastic sword. It was, it was a long night. As